Alrighty then. Um, today's talk's on LibFerris, unsurprisingly. Uh, what it is, and actually why you should be interested in LibFerris, what it can do for you, which is really what I'm hoping to get across. Uh, to give you an idea of the size of the project, version 1.5 was released fairly recently. About over 200,000 lines of code. The core of the file system is about 90k, 64 for plugins, and 20k to reimplement some of the POSIX commands. Um, basically, the, the four areas of it are to make anything that smells like data into a virtual file system, to extract and to store metadata for anything that is a virtual file system, and then once you've got a file system and you've got metadata to allow you to do index and search on anything that LibFerris can present. And then the, la the last trend over the last few years has been to take anything that's a, a LibFerris virtual file system and then turn it into any other data model that might be useful. So you can get at um, the file system as a SQL, uh, SQL Lite virtual table. Uh, how many people here have actually used LibFerris? Excellent. I aimed for a, uh, I aimed for people who didn't know, so I thought, you know, if there are a lot of people who are already familiar with it, then this might be boring. Uh, but no. So starting out from the very, the very beginning, if you have just a, a plain XML file and you have uh, attribute n equals 12 and the contents of one of the XML elements, if you just FLS, no need to mount, you just LS straight into an XML file and it shows you the, the contents of that top uh, XML element. And if you just cat an XML element as a file, then you just get the contents of that element. Um, earlier on, you saw that one of the elements had an attribute n equals 12. If you FLS, uh, in, uh, because the first is a virtual file system, the kernel's extended attributes interface, so you can have key value metadata attached to files. That's also been virtualized in the file system. So when you see EA being a Linux conference, I don't have to sort of say this is metadata. Uh, this is just extended attributes, which are virtual extended attributes. So if, when you're looking at an XML file, XML attributes become extended attributes in the file system. So if you ls showing the extended attribute of n, then you get all the child, all the children, all the values of the n attribute. If you then turn around and say you'd like to sort and reverse numeric order based on the attribute n, then you, you get like a, an ls version sort of that directory. And sorting it in the virtual file system is itself implemented as a virtual file system. So you take a file system, you take a sort order, and it gives you back a resulting file system. Uh, filtering of views is also done the same way and reminiscent of Perl syntax, a uh, regular expression based on an extended attribute. So any, any extended attribute that has a one in it. And the second one, you're looking for any extended attribute with a one with a, a particular name. Uh, Anyone who's familiar with LDAP will sort of notice the syntax of the uh, prefix and uh, that was borrowed from LDAP's uh, search syntax, which seemed like a reasonable idea at the time since uh, directory trees with attributes and with data. Um, of course, just plucking information out of XML through the virtual file system is one thing, but if you want to actually redirect information into and update the XML file, uh, since Bash doesn't know about LibFerris, LibFerris runs like GNOME VFS or like KDE's KIO. It's all uh, user address space. I have a Fuse interface for it, so you can get at it through the kernel. Uh, but if you don't want to do that and you don't want to mount things explicitly, if you just pipe them to the standard in of Ferris redirect, it's sort of like Bash's redirection, except you can redirect to any LibFerris file system. So in this case, I'm updating one of the XML elements just by echoing some data in. And then by cutting the XML file itself, I can see that that's, that update's been effective. Um, of course, um, playing around with XML as a virtual file system is fun, but this also works with Berkeley DB. Uh, F create, you tell it which particular type of file you'd like to create, what name to make, and where to put it. And then you can just do a recursive copy of everything from an XML file directly into a Berkeley DB ISM file. And all of the same commands unsurprisingly work exactly the same way being a virtual file system. So this is probably one of the, the areas of the slides which might get a little grating after a while that since all data sources become virtual file systems, the interaction style for all data sources becomes the same. Uh, if you want to get at that through Fuse so that you don't have to, if your application doesn't want to know anything about LibFerris, 
You can mount libferous stuff through fuse and then just use all the ordinary commands. Uh, in this case, basically just mounting both of those URLs through fuse and using date to update one of the, uh, the files in XML. Where is it? The previous slide. Yes, the previous slide I did a recursive copy from XML into the Berkeley DB4 file, which is kind of annoying. So instead of using CP, uh, you can rsync directly from a uh, fuse-mounted XML file to a fuse-mounted Berkeley DB file to keep the two up to, up to date. This is quite handy if you're using uh, the exposure from libferrist into xQuery, because if you're using xQuery on an XML file and then you're building up a, an index every time in your xQuery, that's going to be really slow. But if you copy your XML data into, say, a Berkeley DB file, and then you use the um, you use the same query looking for an attribute. Obviously, you've got an index persistent file, so your performance is going to be a lot faster. Um, and verification that basically up the update and the rsync have worked using this Berkeley DB's DB dump command. Um, the metadata stuff, which I mentioned, being sort of one of the four four main areas. Oh, I can actually see part of the slides on here. Excellent. Yeah, there we go. I don't have to keep looking around. Wonderful. Um, yes, the metadata interface is based on the, uh, the kernel's extended attribute, but been virtualized. Uh, data can either be derived from the, the file system itself or can be stored in many, many different ways. Um, all metadata can have uh, XSD schema attached, which is incredibly handy if you're presenting data and you want to know whether you should sort numerically or whether you should use a string sort. And uh, the, the schema and other various metadata is itself presented through the same extended attribute interface. All right, it derived metadata. Uh, for a PNG file, uh, if you want to know the width or the height, or you want to know the MD5 of any file, uh, just show that extended attribute, and libferus will calculate the MD5, or libferus will work out what the width of the image file is. Um, that goes for EXIF metadata, basically any metadata that you can get at in a sane way. Um, if there's no plugin for it, then that's sort of a bug, and there should be a plugin for it. It's just a matter of uh, time versus uh, two hands. Um, the content of the file is also available through the same metadata interface. So you can get the schema of the file, you can get the actual file's byte contents, you can get the MD5. Um, the idea of having the file's contents available through the, the metadata interface is that since you can run filtering and you can run sorting, and the sorting can actually use the, anything that's as metadata, you could potentially list a directory based on the contents of the files and how they would sort if they were actually, you know, you could list the directory in the order of the contents of all of the files if that was a desirable thing to do. Which there's no reason saying that of a particular virtual file system that wouldn't be of interest. Uh, stored metadata can either be done through RDF or through the kernel's native VA interface. So if you use the atto command, uh, atto to set a particular attribute and to get an attribute through the kernel. And then you'll, if you use ferris ls, you'll notice that the, the foo attribute just shows up just as any other extended attribute would do. Nothing particularly special needs to be done to, to tell it that. <coughs> if you go through and you... Uh, then use the, the ferrous redirect command that you've seen before, tell it minus A to instead of actually writing the contents of the file to update a particular attribute, you can then again use the native kernel adder command to grab the foo attribute and see that it's been updated. Um, it turns out that's really wonderful uh, in some ways, but extended attributes also in the kernel land can be rather slow, which the SE Linux guys sort of found out. Um, if you're uh, updating a large, amount of, a large amount of extended attributes and there's also a lot of space restrictions and also things like when you start touching file systems that are on NFS, mysteriously the extended attribute interface just sometimes doesn't work unless you've patched your kernel or your distribution sort of one of those rare ones that I haven't seen that implement, well, have pre-patched your kernel for you. Uh, but with libferris, it falls back to RDF metadata if kernel extended attributes aren't available when you're writing metadata. So in this case, I can redirect a particular annotation. The adder command says, you know, there is no annotation for this file. It's on an NFS. Command's not supported. Uh, but then I can use FLS to actually get that RDF data back. 
And this is also quite useful because being a virtual file system, you can mount HTTP and FTP and various other things. You can mount Emacs, so you can't really store a kernel attribute for an Emacs buffer. Um, where am I going? Ah, yes, for those people who actually like RDF, uh, this is all using, a, about a year ago, I moved over to using Soprano from KDE4. So essentially the library under NepoMark that KDE4 uses for its semantic desktop is now the same library that I'm using. So you can, if you want to, go and share your RDF database between the KDE4 desktop and Loferis, or you can just not do that. Um, and you can use Soprano command to actually get out the RDF triples. So if anyone's an RDF fan, come and see me. Um, yes, I had been told in previous talks that I shouldn't really call it a virtual file system, that that idea is not really cool these days, whereas I tend to disagree. So you could call it a data abstraction layer, a CMS, data sources, any other three-letter acronym that you like. Uh, relational databases, moving from XML to Berkeley DB. If you just have a small table called play with a bunch of messages and IDs and uh, other stuff, you can then use FLS to actually get directly at the the relational table as a file system. Uh, if you update a particular attribute for a tuple, and obviously get it back again. Uh, the minus zero in, in uh, FLS asks the file system, what attributes do you think are going to be interesting to the user? Because if you just do a normal LS minus L, then you're going to see your M time, your size, your owner, your group, and that's going to be com completely irrelevant for a relational database table. So minus zero is basically behind the scenes minus zero in Ferris LS says get me the recommended EA attribute, which is a list of all the attributes that the file system thinks for that particular directory are going to be interesting to a user. So that's very handy for, for XML. Every XML attribute will be included there for a relational database, then every uh, column in your table is going to be, be offered. Uh, you can, for Postgres, there's special support for actually calling relational database functions through the file system interface. So if you want to know the ATAN of something, you can directly FCAT the result. Uh, for fa this, this is kind of fun. There's an article on this if you want to do it. If you mount two Postgres tables as file systems through Libverus, you can then use rsync on that to copy one table from one Postgres database to another one. Um, there's a few, these little nasty commands uh, I've added because if you basically you have uh, primary key and other constraints and you need to actually tell Libverus about that so it doesn't try to create tuples when it doesn't have the primary key yet. Uh, <coughs> mounting applications, uh, as I say, as I'd mentioned Emacs before, you can mount Emacs, you can mount Firefox, you can mount the X windows, you can mount your X clipboard. Uh, for Amarok, if you actually want, Amarok playlist is basically your current playlist. And if you CP those files, then you get the files. So if you're sitting there listening to something and all of a sudden you want to just take your music with you, you can just copy your playlist to your mobile device of preference and walk out the door. Uh, Echo, yes, you can also toggle play pause. You can do call direct functionality through the virtual file system. And the Emacs thing is basically a roundabout way of catting a temp file. If you turn around and open the temp file in Emacs, and then you can fcat, basically mount Emacs as a file system and cat the contents of one of the Emacs buffers directly. And that works bidirectionally. You can echo stuff directly into an Emacs buffer if you like. Um, X window stuff, you can, oh yes, I do have the window example. You can move X windows around, the X, Y coordinates, change their size by updating files in the virtual file system. Uh, the clipboard thing is far more useful, where basically you can grab the last 10 clipper clipboard entries as virtual files, or you can echo something directly into the current clipboard contents. Uh, GStreamer and GPhoto are both, both have support. So you can grab webcams, you can grab video streams off webcams as virtual MPEGs, grab webcam snapshots as virtual JPEG files. Um, GPhoto, obviously, you can just slurp all of your stuff off your cameras. And UPnP support, so Myth TV, any other UPnP device. UPnP is incredibly handy because devices that you buy that are really cheap that offer UPnP often have search interfaces that really suck. And if you can mount these as virtual file systems in Libferris, you can index them and then you can search using Libferris. Uh, setting up virtual JPEGs and stuff in GStreamer currently is, revolves around an XML file because it's just incredibly hard to abstract this in a virtual file system in an automated way. 
So lid JPEG basically for this particular laptop. Um, we'll grab a single snapshot through the through the webcam, JPEG encode it, and the last element there is the that actual block for anyone who's played with GStreamer will obviously notice it's a, a block you could pass to GST launch, except the last block is an app sync which basically hands the data to Libverse. And then Libverse says, hey, I've got this virtual file here. Cut it if you like. And then I'll run that and I'll get the data for you. Uh, virtual soft links. Um, yes, everything becomes virtual and everything becomes overlayable at some point. I've been doing this for about 10 years. So a lot of this stuff, if things seem to be strange and crack smoking, there are reasons and they have cropped up over that time. Uh, virtual soft links for GPhoto and for UPnP. A lot of UPnP servers will offer you saying, hey, I'm a UPnP server and here is my ID. And if you're at a bash shell and you see you know, a 50 character ID with backspaces and weird characters in them, it just doesn't make it fun. So with virtual soft links, you can say to match against these horrifically long strings and say, yes, that is actually just you know, box one. Make a virtual link. Whenever I read that directory, box one equals this horrendously long string. Um, editing, if you use the fedit command, it does some funky stuff without using fuse or without using anything else. And anything that you can get at through libferris, you can use fedit and it'll pop up a VI session, which is kind of cool. And then you can edit it. And if you do, when you do shift zz, it all goes back through the strange FIFO stuff that's in the background and goes back to the file system. So no need for mounting, no need for fuse, no need for anything, just directly fediting things. Um, I have support in the last 12 months for Emacs Tramp, which is the note the warning about it being alpha. Um, I have been doing stuff uh, over the network. It uses, I've basically interloped on Tramp's SSH support and I've implemented a few extra POSIX commands in Libferris so that Libferris is sort of, seems like a little POSIX system of its own and Tramp happily edits remote files that happen to be, you know, part of a Berkeley DB4 file or something like that. Um, Web 2.0 becoming file system 1.0, so Flickr, um, Vimeo, YouTube, Facebook, Google Spreadsheets and Google Docs just becoming other virtual file systems. Uh, Web Spreadsheets is a file system. Uh, I've tried to make the URL seem obvious, so Google Spreadsheets, whatever the spreadsheet name is. And then if you echo 5 and 23 into two different cells and a formula into a third cell, and then when you fcat that formula cell back, you Google Translate. Google gets you the result of that calculation. Um, things like uh, Vimeo, 23HQ and other things. Um, if you copy a JPEG file or in the last um, week, I basically implemented support for Canon CR2 files. So if you have a raw CR2 file, you can directly CP it to Flickr using Libferris. And the same sort of thing with videos, you can drop them up onto YouTube. And for people who love Twitter and Facebook, you can echo stuff directly into your status from the file system. Uh, interaction with, uh, with Flickr stuff, you can directly fcat an image straight off Flickr and pipe it into Ocular or something else that will accept an image data on standard in. Um, you can create new comments, you can edit comments, list things. And to actually give more power back to the user, social networks like Facebook and Flickr, etc. Most people don't think of Flickr as a social network, but when you start friending people and getting feeds of their photos, um, I've tried to make things in, well, Facebook's a really, really bad example. They seem to think if you give Facebook your phone number, your friends can't get that phone number. Uh, but other, well, uh, whatever data I can get at legally, I try to put in the V cards. So under Flickr, basically, if you have a friend called Barry and you fcat your contact slash Barry, you just get a V card file. And in the end, I'd like to be able to just take a V card from one site and drop it into the, uh, the contacts on another site and sort of have Luke first say, hey, you know, I know this person. I'll send a friend request. The, the third section being index and search. Let's check how horribly I'm going for time. Not too bad. Yes, if you, uh, if you have large virtual file systems, you end up needing to search for things. And it seemed to be sort of popular, KDE4 having index and search, Tracker being out there, Beagle being out there. So yes, yet another desktop slash network index and search. I have support for full text of uh, documents for metadata. It's all implemented through plugins. So there's no particular, you know, I, I use SQL for index and search. There's a, I have 10 different ways that that can be done. Whatever device it is, you can choose which is gonna be better. And if you have three or four indexes, you can federate them together. So if you have a, a server with a bunch of PDFs on there, 
you can create one index and everyone on your network can federate to that one index. So all of your documentation doesn't have to be indexed by you know, 20 people who are in your office. One index gets maintained on the file server and everyone gets to use it. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, Ferris find operates like POSIX find, except it operates on an index rather than directly polling, the, well, directly trawling the file system looking for your predicate. So you can do things like instead of doing find and then trying to limit what URL you're finding in, you can just do Ferris find slash and then whatever your predicates are and it'll come back. If the predicate's selective enough, like if you're looking for something with one MD5, it'll obviously just come back within a second. Uh, the plugins I have support for Java Lucene, C Lucene, Postgres, uh, Zapien. I, I can actually federate to Beagle and Striggy. So if you have a Beagle index and you have something else you want to index, you can in search both of those through Loop Ferris. Um, well, obviously web search is low hanging fruit. I also have a specialized memory map index and search. So the N810 uh, with a 400 meg odd uh, ARM chip. Of indexed audio that's 10 times larger than can possibly fit on flash that you could attach to that device. Uh, indexed it on the device over NFS and then regex searches looking for you know, music by Willie Nelson. Basically the search is almost instant. So yeah, there are alternatives if you have MAMO devices to whatever index and search is coming with them. Uh, how to go about doing this, I have these bunches of commands up the top. Uh, basically if you want to use, I would recommend if you have a, a large-ish store, like you know, somewhere 1 million to 1 billion files that you want to index, the Postgres module is a great, great thing for that. Um, drop the database just to make sure it's clean. Again, the fcrate command. Um, I've taken a leaf out of Plan 9's book. When you create an index, you give it a file system directory and say, shovel your metadata there, and that will be my index. So if you want to refer to one particular index, you just give it a directory. If you want to refer to another index, you give it another directory. And if you want to federate directories together, you say, here are five directories. Make a new index here that refer to these five. Directories, using directories as a namespace is really quite handy. But then again, I'm a file systems guy. Um, so then if you just run find on slash audio, I have, I've left it out of Ferris explicitly. There's no sort of, you know, oh, you create an index and it'll keep polling your home directory and updating things as quickly as it can and look in var. That doesn't happen. Um, if you want to update an index, you do it. So you run find. Ferris is smart enough. If you, if it's, you see it's a file that hasn't been modified, it won't go and re-index the whole file. So you can pipe it, you know, a million files, and if three of them have been updated, three files get updated in the index. So you just run find on all your audio files, pipe that into index add. And running a compact is kind of a nice thing to do for the index, but everyone who's played with databases here will, will know that vacuums and compacts are quite useful. And again, you see the same uh, regular expression predicate stuff, prefix and commands, prefix ors if you want to or, or your predicates together. So you can look for Willie Nelson, songs about whiskey. Uh, if you'd like actually to get your search results back as a virtual file system, strangely enough, you can run as the EAQ, which is an extended attribute query. So the FLS command gives you back a virtual file system. If you'd like, you can then mount that as Fuse. So you have a Fuse file system that shows you the results of a search whenever you read the directory. Uh, recent stuff on the, in the indexing stuff is mutation. So for Postgres indexes, you can then turn around and add new columns and basically tell it to update the index with that and explicitly re-index specific files for that column. Um, I've also started adding support exp expressly for subtitles. So you can then do full text index search on subtitles for video files that you've indexed. And there were little gotchas there where subtitles can be surprisingly humongous for certain files. Uh, speed tips for this. Uh, if anyone's an NFS guru, I'd love to speak with you. But um, running find over NFS or running find through SSH on the other server, I've found that there's significant differences in speed if you've got, like, you know, the directory has a million files in it. So SSHing the other end, running find and piping the results back to where you want to index it can be really quite a huge speed up. And if you only want to index five attributes, um, yes, it's a hack, but using an environment variable and saying, these are the five attributes I want, then the first won't even bother sort of thinking, oh, but I can generate this really funky foo2 attribute, but it'll take time. So if you do that, this is how I did it on the, uh, the 400 meg ARM chip. Basically, I just said, you know, 
for audio files, these are the things. You know, I want ID3 tags, I want the URL, I want the size, I want the modification time, and just put those expressly in that environment variable. And you can sort of, on, even on a slow ARM chip, you can bang through at about 10 to 20 milliseconds per file. Uh, special support in the index and search for geotagging for, uh, so if you have something that's tagged with a geospatial tag, you can then say find me things that are tagged with other geospatial tags that are within 50 kilometers in a square box from this particular tag, which makes it kind of cool for sort of bouncing around places in index and search. Um, whenever you modify an annotation for a file, a dbus signal is emitted. So then you can monitor that file, monitor that if you like, and immediately update your indexes when people make new annotations. Uh, Postgres has special support for binary tags. So whether, again, uh, things like your geospatial tagging being just binary, does it have this tag, does it not? And in Postgres, it uses GIST stuff. So if you are looking for something that's got two or three tags, you know, is foo, is bar, uh, as soon as you've got three, the GIST stuff will make that search incredibly fast. And my PhD was actually on uh, index and search stuff using formal concept analysis, which is an un unsupervised machine learning and natural clustering algorithm. So then, yes, if anyone's interested in that sort of stuff, come and see me. Uh, ways to get at Libferris, um, it's native APIs, C++ standard IO streams, and you can get attributes as strings, you can set attributes, you can get and set as standard strings, and you can also get attributes as standard IO streams. Um, QT, GTK2 model, you can get at the whole thing as virtual tables in SQL Lite through Fuse, as a virtual document in an X query. From KDE4's Plasma, I can mount Plasma, and I can be mounted as Plasma. Once again, sort of everything being and everything going the other way. And the entire virtual file system can be got at as an XOCC document object model. So if you want, you can start at slash and you can go anywhere you like. You can get an Emacs, you can get a, a running Emacs's buffer session through an Emacs, an X, XOCC's DOM. And I've re-implemented a whole bunch of POSIX commands so you don't have to use Fuse if you don't want to. And there are a whole bunch of POSIX commands that you'll find. Generally, there's a ferrous or an f prefix, and if it's a GTK2 client, there's a gf index prefix, sorry. Um, and probably soon there'll be QT4 re-implementations or QML re-implementations, so that if you have, you know, little mobile devicey things, then uh, you can get it with ferrous with your thumb. Ferris LS also lets you get at anything that's a file system using SXML or SRDF XML, if either of those are going to be handy. Getting at stuff as XML is kind of quite useful, I've found through PHP or through other server-side stuff, because once you get your data as XML, you can easily sort of chuff that off to users. Um, the Q GTK2 uh, data, mo data tree model I use in the Ego File Manager. And the QML one, obviously, is not actually a, a file manager -y shot. Um, one thing that I'm particularly happy with there, which I don't know why, it's not that I'm, well, in a way I'm gloating about it, but also the fact that other applications could do the same thing fairly easily, and I don't know why other applications don't, where you can do cascaded sort. Like, why in a file manager you want to sort by the, the MIME type of a file, and then you don't want to sort by the size of the file as well? It's just strange. It's such a useful feature. Um, getting out of the first file system through XQuery, instead of using, this is, the parts in bold have been slightly modified. The top two are actually modified from a XQuery that would run natively on XML. So instead of running on XML, you run on a DB, uh, .db, Berkeley DB4 file, and instead of using doc to actually get at it, like the standard doc function, you use ferrous doc. And ferrous doc will take any, any URL to a that libferris could mount as a file system through ferris ls, et cetera, and we'll give that back to you as something that xquery can evaluate. So in this case, if customers XML had a million customers and you were looking up someone by their family name, uh, that's going to be incredibly slow if the XML file is huge, but if it's a Berkeley DB4 file, it's going to be, well, anything that, well, if it's a hash, actually, it's going to be a single seek. Uh, SQL Lite, which is uh, kind of useful for anyone who likes SQL. Uh, small XML file, and you get back a result of 51.3 if you do this. 
which is to load the VTable file, create a, uh, a virtual table in SQLite uh, using libferris, tell it you want the top element of that XML file and you want these attributes and these are the types of those attributes that SQLite should use. And then I've just selected the average age from the virtual table. If you have a whole bunch of uh, image files and you want to get a graph of relative to group by aperture size or uh, group by exposure time, um, I found this to be kind of a handy way to actually do that. And of course you can do other wonderful any SQLE sort of thing that you like once you've got the data available through SQLite. Uh, Plasma, which theoretically seemed like a good idea at the time. No? Okay. There we go. Ah, excellent stuff. So uh, KDE4's Plasma, this is the stuff that's used for the uh, desktop widgets, etc. And in this particular little video, basically, um, you update part of the Google spreadsheet in the browser, which calculates a result, and that particular field is just showing a virtual file. And then when you paste the contents of something else into another virtual file, you'll find the Google spreadsheet gets updated, which updates the formula, which then updates the data on your desktop. So stuff that's on the web and stuff that's on your desktop equals the same. It's all just a virtual file system. Uh, where to go to get more information? Uh, just in the January edition, uh, actually that should be January 2011. Yes, in the current January edition of the Linux magazine, there's stuff on doing federated indexing with libferris. So if you want to maintain a single index and do desktop search and have the index maintained once on your file server, this is an interesting article to read. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in Linux journals, some stuff in Linux format, and if you want to do rsync on Postgres mounted, see a few years ago in Linux Magazine. If you want to do SQLite stuff uh, with libferris and uh, linux.com, an introductory article on LWN, and if you're really keen, you can come and ask me. Ha -ha. And yes, I love this particular shot, which I don't know whether you can see. Um, in Europe, they decided to sell a toilet fishing bowl, which is not quite what it first seems, but yes, I don't know why you'd want to fish on the toilet. Um, Libferris is GPL version 3. I've changed it from version 2 plus in the last year to, to version 3 for your pleasure and selective capitalism. Um, yes, I only mention that because people seem to think that um, Yes, I'm very close to the end. People seem to think that uh, GPL is against capitalism, and I think much the opposite, that it's not, that it endorses capitalism because it empowers people to actually make, choose who they're going to pay to improve software, which I think is a great thing. Uh, in the future, more and faster, more manning of web services, more updating web services, Perl IO all, which I've been mentioning for six months or so, but that will happen. And yes, patches from the crowd are accepted, or you know, if anyone has an old Ducati that they no longer need, that's accepted as well. And yes, the toilet fishing cam is my last slide. So now I have time for questions. Yep. How does it uh, wait till the microphone? Everyone gets a microphone. Um, how does it handle authentication against you know remote services that require a username and password? Um, yeah, if you're doing that with HTTP and stuff like that, I maintain a special file, like a secure Berkeley DB in your .ferris directory. I, I find it to be better to actually keep username and passwords out of band. So instead of having in the HTTP URL, you know, this is Ben, this is my password expressly as part of the URL. I really don't like that because the opportunity to copy and paste is just too, uh, it's too easy. So. Um, if you're actually authenticating to, one off, to sites one off, then you need to actually set that up uh, or tell the first few username and password for that. For Google, um, for web services stuff, I try to actually do stuff that's not evil. For Google at the moment, I just say, what's your Google username and password? So I really need to do OAuth and stuff like that that is sort of better. Um, for Facebook, there's actually an evil hack that floats around where you can, instead of saying, you know, this is libferris, do you want to authenticate this libferris application um, and allow it to use it? And then Facebook would normally sort of drop you after a month. You can actually tell them um, through nasty little REST APIs and get a permanent authentication. 
which I don't know how long that'll last for, but um, yes, it shows that Facebook's code is good quality and there's no back end. Um, yes, yeah, so hopefully that answers it. If, if there's stuff like the Google thing I know is horrible, um, but again, I sort of use Google for fun. If anyone wants to use it for profit, then I can do iOrth and better, um, you know, better management there rather than what's your password expressly and I'll keep that here for you. I guess what I want to know is if you do, you know, say a cat on Google, is it going to prompt you each and every time, no, no, or does it remember you from, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, the command one before? If you cat on Google uh, for authentication, it just, it, Libferis will have known your username and password. The same thing for Flickr. Like, you know, in any of those web service, basically I try to opt for the authenticate, you will allow the application Libferis access, and then any subsequent I.O. that you do to that web service, it'll try and use the same auth token. Right, okay. So, yeah. Cool. Yes, being prompted for passwords really sucks. So, um, how's the introspection done for the applications, like Mozilla or for the or for the X server itself? How do you introspect the data there that you're going to share later? Um, yeah, uh, for Emacs, I basically have a bunch of ellipse st ellipse stuff, and for Mozilla, it's the same sort of thing. Like it all sort of. You have to install a little plugin into your Firefox, and then Libferis sort of says to the plugin, "Hey, you know, what's your, what's your document object model? Give me that back." But the converse part is, if you have an image on a web page and you know roughly where it is in the DOM, you can just cat that image. So I, th I think it's actually kind of handy to be able to see. You know, we have this this browser which is incredibly good at breaking down document object models, but people seem to think it's a silo that you have to click forward and back and click on links. But just being able to harvest, there's a JPEG. I'll just cat that JPEG. So, but yes, any applications. Um, Amarok's actually quite easy. Anything that's got a Dbus interface makes it easy. You can mount Dbus as a file system, so. Um, that just really caught my attention there with mounting Dbus as a file system. Uh, one thing I really missed that they took away in KDE 3 was DCOP and being able to use the command line to control um, aspects of KDE. Does this allow you to put that back in easily with, um, with, DCOP, with Dbus or? Um, depending. I've, the, the main thing I hate about Dbus is the way it handles structures. And I've been told this is you know, the fact that Qt, because I actually mount, moved to mounting Dbus through Qt, and I've been told that Qt4 sort of sucks in, mounting, in, in getting at Dbus. Because if you have composite data that is offered as a structure on Dbus, then it's really, it's difficult to pluck things out. But yeah, I mean, the same sort of scripting, like you know, if you cat into pause play, um, it'll do toggle that state in the application, or change the volume and things like that. Um, but just raw mounting Dbus, yeah, that should actually give you a whole bunch of power. It's similar to when you've mounted Postgres. You can just call a function with data and get the result back. So just catting files, you should be able to do some scripting. Um, I see all this stuff and I think, hey, this is really cool. I want to go and play with this. Um, how does it scale in terms, so I've got like uh, 200 gig of XML files sitting on a server somewhere. Um, is that a scary amount of data for it to process or is it just a case of indexing it correctly and then you can go Is the 200 it? gig a single XML file? Because <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of hefty. Um, it does use DOM to actually pass XML, so you need to vote uh, everything that implies. Uh, but if you have reasonable bite-sized XML files, and as I say, you know, it will actually remember the end time of the file and it won't chug over the whole XML file the subsequent times. So, yes, it should handle that. Can it decompress them on the fly? Uh, if it can't, I can make it. Okay. But, uh, yeah. It has support for doing chunk-based uh, compression with LZ and with GZIP and other, well, LibZ, other sort of stuff. So that was, that was kind of fun, but, um, yes. I haven't actually, well, as I say, if you want to do something that it doesn't do, it's not that hard to make it do it. And in that particular case, I think, you know, if it doesn't do it, then I'll fix it. It's a bug. More questions? Questions, anyone? Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, let's put our hands together for our speaker. Now, on behalf of LCA, to show our appreciation for the efforts of putting together his presentation, I'd like to give this to our speaker. Ah, thank you. Thank you.